information just goes away in the month that we meeting. Good morning. I call to order the uh, Regional Transportation Committee meeting for Tuesday, June 20th. Uh, I am your chair, Steve Conklin. We are just shy of a quorum, so we're going to tweak the agenda a little bit and deal with some information items, so don't be surprised. I think I used to be in radio. Microphones kind of... <laughs> Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I will give it a second to see if we have any hands raised remotely or in person, and I don't see either. Okay. I will call your attention to the May 16th, 2023 RTC meeting summary in the packet. Uh, we don't need any formal action on that, correct? Uh, but that is in the packet. And we will skip ahead to informational briefings, starting with a statewide transportation program distribution. Uh, Alvin Bedell Sanchez, Regional Transportation Program Manager. Surprise, you get to go earlier than you thought on the agenda. No pressure. After a holiday weekend, so very much appreciate it. Uh, morning, everyone. So uh, as uh, introduced, program distribution and its impact on Dr. Cog. Um, before we get into too much, just some basics for folk in the room who aren't as well aware of program distribution, but it is part of the statewide transportation plan. Um, it outlines projected revenues to various program areas uh, for the full time period of the plan. It is a long term view, uh, and so it's how will funding be allocated across those different program areas, how those different regions to different MPOs uh, in the state. Um, only funding that can be generated under current law and average economic conditions is included in program distribution and it includes all federal and state sources that we're aware of at the moment. And then a key piece for us is this is actually the foundation for our regional transportation plans financial plan and that carries forward into our transportation improvement program when we talk about expected revenues, expected expenditures uh, related to operations and maintenance. So uh, going into that uh, foundational piece for how it affects the RTP and the TIP, um, under revenue assumptions, there's actually a number of different pieces that go into that piece for us. Uh, just focusing on CDOT program distribution, that's all the state and federal funding sources that we believe will be available to CDOT and Dr. Cog over the next 20 to 30 years, just depending on what the timeline of the plan horizon is. Um, but we also take into account what does RTD's financial plan look like? What are some local funding pieces from our toll authorities? Um, what are locals uh, committing to over the next 20 to 30 years of their own funds that could be spent in the region. So that all goes into a bucket called revenue assumptions. And then we pair that with expenditure assumptions. So we recognize that all the funding, all the revenue over the next 20 to 30 years cannot be put on specific projects. Um, some of it's already called for. So uh, using those two, we build our financial plan. And so that gives us an idea of how much money is actually available over the next 20 to 30 years that we can solicit projects for, what are our major project and program investments that we can include in the plan. So when we talk about physical constraint, when we talk about not having enough money uh, to include everyone's priorities over the next 20 to 30 years, uh, that starts as the foundation for that. And then it carries forward into the TIP, the latest TIP that we're working on. So what are those expected revenues? What are uh, the O&M assumptions that we're making in the transportation improvement program? So looking at our latest program distribution that we used for our 2050 regional transportation plan, um, CDOT did adopt a high revenue scenario for that program distribution. Uh, it began in 2025 and we carried that forward into our financial plan. Uh, we did participate in that program distribution process. So working with CDOT to determine how much funding, what proportion is going to each of the different program areas that are outlined in program distribution, the different funding types that come to the Dr. Cog region. Uh, You'll know, remember that our 2050 regional transportation plan goes out an extra five years from CDOT's 2045 program distribution. So we did forecast out those remaining five years just using average growth rates that we were seeing in those different funding types program areas. So um, whether that was surface treatment, transportation alternatives, we just looked at how those programs were growing through the life of program distribution and carried that forward into our financial plan for the last five years just to make up that five-year gap that was missing for our plan. As part of creating our financial plan, we also do an exercise with CDOT and other staff in the region, RTD, the local member governments, just to determine what percentage of each of those funding types, those program areas, is actually available for projects. So if you open up Table 3.1, Table 3.2 in our regional transportation plan, that list of projects and 
is uh, how we determine um, what can actually go to a specific line item project. And then what's just available, we call buckets of funding, um, groupings of funding, uh, just a large share of funding that we know are smaller scale projects that aren't going to, uh, we're not going to list every sidewalk, list every transit operation project, but we know that are occurring in the region. And so that's an exercise we do with, doctor, with CDOT staff using program distribution, what percentage is actually available for us to allocate two projects in the plan to determine our fiscal constraint. Um, for CDOT, roughly 62% of CDOT's funding goes to programmatic expenses, as we call them. So those buckets of funding uh, where we're not listing individual listed projects. So just reflecting that uh, they're maintaining, operating, enhancing the current system uh, because Dr. Cog staff do have more uh, leniency with Dr. Cog administered funds, 82% of the funds that we administer are towards capital projects. So those individually listed projects in table 3.1 and table 3.2. So program distribution, uh, the financial plan impacts the three uh, investment priorities that are currently highlighted on the screen. So those specific project lists, those project categories, and then those investment allocations. So like I've mentioned, program distribution really is the foundation for how we build our financial plan and how we determine what's available for us to include in our plan under a fiscal constraint exercise. And then tying this up, uh, looking at the last program distribution that occurred that we used to build our financial plan for the 2050 RTP, this is only looking at uh, 2021 to 2045, just for an apples to apples comparison of when we first built the financial plan. But you can see across these different program areas as you uh, scroll down, um, as you look at the Dr. Cog total compared to the CDOT total, that varies just depending on what the program area is, what the funding type is. Surface treatment, for example, about 33% of funding is going to the Dr. Cog region. Um, compare that to some of the funding that's more formula-based that comes down from our federal partners like surface transportation, congestion mitigation, air quality, where you're seeing 75 to 81% of funding going to the Dr. Cog region compared to the state total. Uh, but overall, looking at program distribution out to 2045, around 31% of funding from program distribution is going to the Dr. Cog region. Um, you all know we have a number of different acronyms that we use here at Dr. Cog. What are the different roles we play? One we don't talk too often on is the TPR, the Transportation Planning Region, um, but we are the Greater Denver Area TPR, so we do function in that role. Uh, as part of program distribution, CDOT works with all of the 15 TPRs in the state, so we are one of those 15 that, that, we work, that they work with. Uh, they just had a kickoff a couple weeks back with staff from Dr. Cog, so uh, starting the program distribution conversation, they just wrapped up those conversations with the other four MPOs in the state. And so as they move forward, they'll be working through the statewide MPO monthly meetings and stack to update program distribution. Um, so now that we've uh, gone through where we were with the latest program distribution, uh, we wanted to just share some information related to what percentage of the state we are compared to some different metrics. Um, here at Dr. Call, we like to mention that we are roughly half the state in a number of different, met different measures. And so we pulled a couple that we have readily available just to illustrate um, what percentage of the state are we, are we contributing, what the need might be in the region. And so just starting with some demographic, economic variables in terms of population, 58% of the state, uh, employment, number of jobs, 64%, and then the income and wages in the state, 71%. So those last two are pulled from uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics data. And then related to travel measures, um, we do have a lot more data available there, but um, roughly 15 million out of 30 million trips occur in the Dr. Cog region out of the state as a whole. And we can also look at vehicle miles traveled uh, on the CDOT system about half. If you even just look at I-25 and I-70 within our region, 20% uh, of CDOT's VMT occurs on those stretches of highway within our region. Um, if you look at lane miles, uh, and just specifically CDOT system, that does drop down when you're only looking at what is considered on system by CDOT, but 19, 13% respectively. And then getting away from just some of those specific travel measures, um, traffic fatalities, uh, epidemic on our roadways, 46% of fatalities in the state occur within the Dr. Cog planning area. And then even transit trips, a uh, much higher percentage there, 70% of transit trips that occur in the state are within the Dr. Cog region. So some takeaways as we wrap up this presentation, uh, the Dr. Cog region is the economic engine for the state. In terms of both need and contribution, we are half the state or more in terms of different metrics that we use. We as staff recognize that the Denver region will ever receive one for one, uh, what it's putting into the system, what it's getting out. But as conversations around program distribution continue, uh, we do want to keep advocating for a fair share to the Denver region. So asking those questions around what data is being used, what are the definitions that are being used for the different funding types, program areas, 
um, what are the formulas that are being developed. So as those conversations continue uh, and come before us, we'll continue that advocacy. And then just to wrap up what this impact will have on some of our future products, uh, as Stack and the TC make their final uh, considerations on program distribution early next year, we'll actually uh, lead straight into the kickoff of our next major four-year update to the regional transportation plan. So rebuilding the financial plan, rebuilding fiscal constraint, uh, redoing all of our quality conformity, GHG requirements. So our major four-year update, this program distribution will be the foundation for our new financial plan. Um, this also carries forward in the two new tips that are being developed during that time period. So the fiscal year 26-29 tip, which won't have a new call for projects, and then the fiscal year 28-31 tip, where there will be uh, the regional and sub-regional calls for projects. So some major project product updates coming from our end that we will be using program distribution to build out our financial plans and revenue and expenditure assumptions over the next 20 to 30 years. Uh, with that concludes the presentation. Sure. Absorb. Um, b before um, questions to the committee, I'd, uh, Alvin, thank you for the presentation. Really, really appreciate that. I wanted to sort of ground for the group sort of why we're bringing this forward now, right? Because the state is embarking on this conversation about revenue distribution, uh, program distribution. It's a really significant conversation. Thank God it only happens every four years because that's not a lot of fun. Um, and there's, con there's big arguments around the state about the distribution of, of funding because there's not enough funding to go around to address the state's transportation. Uh, we thought it was really important for this group to understand and have some grounding. Can you go back a couple of slides to the uh, travel measures um, piece? Thank you. Got that one. Some important, I think, things to think about in conversations that we're having uh, between ourselves and CDOT staff as we as we look at this. The, the formulas for the different programs are really important to consider. And obviously, we're a big state, and the state has a big highway system that has long stretches of rural state highways. Um, and, and so lane miles is an important consideration. Um, but one of the things we think about is that a lane mile in the Denver metro area is not the same as a lane mile of rural state highway that typically doesn't have curb and gutter, doesn't have a lot of signs, doesn't have a lot of signals associated with it, compared to an urban freeway lane mile that's a very much more complex system. So sort of there's differences in the type of facilities or even an urban state highway like Federal Boulevard. It's a very different corridor than a rural state highway corridor, right? So, it, so the, just the measure of lane miles doesn't quite capture that distinction between types of facilities. And then the last thing I want to point out on this slide that we're, we're thinking about is that um, there's significant portions of the state highway system that don't seem to be captured in the measure of lane miles. So in, think, of, think of freeway to freeway ramps like I-25 to I-70. Big sweeping ramps, it's a big bridge structure, it's a very complex structure. That, those lanes are not actually calculated in the lane mile calculation, it's just the main line part of the system. Auxiliary lanes on the freeway system are not calculated as part of the lane mile calculation. So there's big, there's big parts of the system that exist in the, in the urban parts of the state that aren't captured by the state's sort of statewide measures of lane miles. So I just wanted to kind of ground that for the group and, um, Appreciate this conversation. You'll hear more about it as we move forward. This is going to be a several month discussion process at the statewide transportation advisory committee and ultimately the commission. Uh, questions in just a moment. If I could get everybody uh, kind of halfway through the room to, to change your uh, name thing so I can read it. <laughs> and I, I, I may still murder names, but uh, uh, Commissioner Adams. I just have a question. This is a very interesting problem that, you know, we sitting at CDOT are constantly confronted with the rural need for more, more work on roads. And if you look at the data, our roads are in desperate need of repair, even in the rural communities. Do you have any uh, comparative data on how other states look compared to Colorado in terms of this this urban versus rural dilemma and and how they do the same comparison. I, I'd love to understand a little bit better because I agree we're never going to be one to one, but I, I'd like to understand what is a what is a notion. And I'm not going to I'm not going to press you with the notion of do you have a recommendation of what's adequate from Dr. Cog's standpoint, but I do, I would like to see 
more data from other places so that there's a there's a little bit of comparison that I, I might make as a CDOT commissioner. Thank you. We can look into um, what data might be available to check that urban rural exercise out. No questions or comments. Mr. Shaw. Thank you. Well, it, it is interesting to me that we look like we're a little over half of the total system in lane miles and a little less than half in the fatalities, which always amazes me because people are crazy on the roads out there. <laughs> but, um, but really, I guess, uh, in the less of uh, the roads with less signage, you may have wrong way drivers more often and things like that that contribute to uh, uh, rural fatalities. But I thought that was just kind of an interesting thing with, with uh, what we see today on the roads. Thank you. To clarify, though, I think I heard you say that we're over half in lane miles. You meant over half in vehicle miles traveled? Oh, okay. Awesome. No clarification, so thank you. Other questions, comments? Rex. Thank you, sir, very much, and good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, I want to thank staff for bringing this forward. And as Ron mentioned, this will be something as an iterative thing for us that we'll be bringing forward just to I mean, one of the purposes I was to kind of just provide you with, you know, some understanding of the process and how it all works. And, you know, this has been an ongoing battle for the metropolitan area for many, many years. Um, my first year here, Dr. Cog, was the first was a year in which they were going through program distribution. I've never seen anything like that before. That was that is the third state. Director Adams that I worked in, and I was not familiar with the process that we have here, you know, and it, and it happens at Stack, right, the, the, the State Transportation Advisory Committee, which is very rurally dominated, um, you know, with regards to the votes at the table. Um, but we do have excellent relationships with our with our transportation commissioners, and we am been able to you know provide some additional information to you all in order to express where we stand on this. I mean, in the past, this has there's been a lot of acrimony about this. There have been um, MOUs that have been established with CDOT um, uh, fixing a minimum for the metropolitan area through the, in, through the years. Jeff Coleman might have actually been there at those times. That was very contentious times. Now, we're not suggesting that, but we do want a fair shake at the table. And um, it just seems slowly but surely um, some of the criteria that are being introduced and used at maybe a higher percent of as the ratio seems to be trending to, away from you know what we consider to be fair equity so i just i just wanted to lay that on the table that you know we're going to be there and we're going to be banging our fists as much as we can but it's still it's a it's an up it's an uphill battle at stack uh, may I make one comment i i totally agree with you because that's i sit in on all the stack meetings and certainly we hear this from them all the time that they're not getting enough resources uh, towards their problems and they continue to cite the contributions that they're making towards our more urban communities that if we don't uh, address some of their problems, even though some of those roads are a lot less traveled, they do consider them to be very important from their standpoint. Thank you. Just to, uh, to, to reset, uh, we started with informational briefings. We've just finished the statewide transportation program distribution. We now have a quorum. Do we want to loop back and do the action items or finish with the informational briefings? Okay, we will move, we will, we will double back to action items. So item number four, uh, the Transportation Advisory Committee Special Interest Seats Appointment, Jacob Rieger, Multimodal Transportation Planning Manager. Sir. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, we wanted to bring this item to you. There's no PowerPoint today, but just wanted to have a little bit of a conversation around our Transportation Advisory Committee. Um, those on the Dr. Cog board may recall that recently back at your March meeting, um, you approved updates and revisions to our Dr. Cog policy on committee guidelines, 
which is our document that actually kind of governs, um, sets the sets the requirements and the the roles and responsibilities for our different Dr. Cog committees. It had been a few years since we'd updated that document. So we made updates to several committees, including this committee, um, but as well as Transportation Advisory Committee. Um, and as part of the changes to the Transportation Advisory Committee, or TAC, um, and I outlined them here in the memo, we did make a few kind of big changes. Before I get into specific things, though, just, you know, the big philosophical picture is that um, specifically in the committee guidelines, it says that we will do a review with the board chair and the regional transportation committee in the second quarter of each year regarding TAC membership. And we did that intentionally. Uh, we've had that clause in there. We've kept that clause in there um, because we want to preserve and strengthen that link um, because TAC ultimately advises you. They make recommendations to you. All the items that come to RTC typically have gone uh, to TAC first, particularly action items, start with TAC and then they come to you. Um, and then they come to the Dr. Cog board. So it's important to really preserve and strengthen that link, as I said, uh, between the work of the Transportation Advisory Committee um, and our board chair and all of you on RTC. So with that, um, some of the changes that were made to TAC membership through the updated committee guidelines, the biggest change, well, there were a couple of really big changes. Um, first is that historically, um, local government members, and I'll show you the roster in a moment, we have different types of members on TAC, but primarily local government members, your staff, are on TAC. Um, previously, those local government members were um, approved. They were um, selected directly by the Dr. Cog board chair based on recommendations from the local governments. A um, little bit of a unique structure of doing that around the country. Um, in the updated committee guidelines, those local government representatives will now be appointed by the sub-regional county transportation forums. Um, and the reason we did that is because I'd already been going to the forums whenever we had a vacancy to get their recommendation for a new candidate to bring to the chair. So uh, we work through the forums. We trust the forums. Again, your staff, um, many of you are on your county's forums. So we're using those um, to now uh, directly uh, appoint local government members. Um, a second change was that in our sixth largest population urban counties, um, currently the counties have two seats. And by counties, I mean um, the small C, the geography, the counties, and the local governments. Um, currently, the counties have had two um, members and two alternates on TAC. In our sixth largest population urban counties, we added a member so that they would now have three members and three alternates. So the forums had actually been working over the spring um, to appoint those third um, kind of members for each county, again, small C geography. And then finally, uh, we've always had special interest, what we call special interest seats on TAC. Those are folks who are um, subject matter experts in fields related to transportation. And I'll show you the roster in just a moment. This is actually the item for you, the action item for you today. Each year, RTC approves or reapproves um, the representatives who are our special interest seat members on TAC. And as part of the update to the committee guidelines, and I'll go to the roster now, um, we changed some of the special interest seats um, kind of members, the representatives. Um, well, this is a local government, just so you can see the first part of the roster. These are local government members um, based on the work of the forums. Um, this is the updated roster of our local government representatives for TAC. And then here are the special interest seat members. So one or two of these we made kind of a standing um, sort of member that was via mobility in particular as the primary non-RTD provider of transit in the region. Um, but we also added three special interest seats um, in the areas related to housing. Uh, we used to have on the uh, transportation demand management non-motorized. That used to be a shared special interest seat that we would rotate. Uh, we decided both of those were important. We made them individual seats. Um, and then we also created an equity special interest seat, and we purposely kept that very open, but we felt the concept of equity was very important. We wanted to have an equity representative. Um, so we actually did a recruitment for these new seats, and we also did a recommended uh, replacement for the aviation seat. The aviation member asked that he step down, um, and there's a... Um, uh, there's a recommended replacement. We are still working to fill the equity seat. When we did our initial recruitment, uh, we actually did not get any candidates, and so we didn't want to just rush that through. We wanted to be more thoughtful. We're going to take some time and do some additional recruitment there. But for the other special interest seats, we either have um, incumbent members who um, are willing to continue to serve, um, and then a couple new members based on the new seats. So the action item actually is for RTC to approve 
um, the special interest seat members for TAC for the coming year. Um, but again, we wanted to kind of show you the entire uh, roster of TAC, the membership, and talk about the recent changes. So I'll end by pointing out that all of this will take effect at the June 26 TAC meeting next week. Because we will have so many new members and alternates, we're actually planning um, a luncheon, a meet and greet networking luncheon uh, for TAC. Uh, we'll be having a catered lunch for the TAC members and alternates, as well as our transportation planning staff. Uh, we've had some new staff, as you know, so we want to give everyone a chance to kind of know each other a little bit. And then I'll be doing an orientation for Dr. Cog and the Transportation Advisory Committee as part of the June 26 TAC meeting uh, for the new members and alternates. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. But again, we're looking for approval um, of the special interest seats. Actually, one more thing. I will mention that of all the things that you do, I talked about kind of the flow of action items, starting with TAC, coming through RTC, and going directly to the board. This is the one item, the approval of the TAC special interest seats, that you as RTC actually do directly. This does not go to the Dr. Cog board because this is an MPO function of our Transportation Advisory Committee and the MPO work that we do. It's you all as sort of the MPO, what we call the 3C Coordination Committee between our agencies um, that approves the special interest seats directly. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions? <clears throat> Seeing none, do we have a motion? Special Ward. Uh, so moved. Second. Second. And with that, any further discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. And any opposed, nay. Very much. Thanks. Mr. Chairman, if I may, before you go to the next item, I just wanted to give you an update on, you will recall that we changed our committee guidelines as part of the uh, RTC as well. And we are including some additional uh, membership associated with that. We're, we're finalizing those recommendations right now. And uh, uh, according to the policy, I will then share that with uh, Director Johnson and Director, Director Liu, and we'll reach consensus on those recommendations before we bring it back to you all. So that should be coming soon. Thank you very much. Moving ahead to item number five, fiscal year 2022-23 transportation improvement program with the TIP amendments and Schwenk, transportation planner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So we do have four uh, proposed amendments to the transportation improvement program today. Two of these are related, so I'll run through those two first. Um, so back in 2008, the Dr. Cog board made a second commitment in principle to fast tracks where specific amounts of funding were ear essentially earmarked within the TIP for 11 different fast tracks corridors. Um, up to today, nine of those have programmed their funds to specific projects within the TIP. Uh, today, we're bringing forth the 10th of them. Um, so the Southwest Corridor Partners have, uh, and, and that is made up of a group uh, made up of the city of Littleton, Arapahoe County, Douglas County, and RTD. Um, they've brought forward a proposal for the funds programmed to the Southwest Corridor Extension. Uh, which would be multimodal improvements along Mineral Avenue, improving access to Mineral Station. So the two changes within the TIP would be to, one, remove those funds from the second commitment in principal pool, um, and two, to program those to a new City of Littleton project uh, for improvements along Mineral Avenue. The other proposed amendments, uh, one would be additional funding, uh, including $11 million in state legislative funding and $185 million in federal TIFIA loans for the I-25 Segment 5 project, as well as a uh, new project for the I-70 and Harvest Interchange. This is an entirely locally funded project, um, but we are required to list it in the TIP um, as new interchanges are considered regionally significant for air quality purposes. Um, so we are just adding that local funding um, into the TIP for this project. So happy to take any questions on these four projects. Otherwise, I do have a proposed motion available for you in your packets. Sorry. The <laughs> there we go. Uh, I, I heard you mention three projects, but not the fourth. Um, the... Uh, the Fast Tracks project is two, so the first would be removing the funds from the second commitment in principal pool, and the second would be programming those funds to the new Littleton project. Thank you very much for that clarification. Questions, comments? Epsdorf. Gosh, 
what's the eleventh commitment in principle project that we're still waiting on? Yes, uh, so that would be for the central corridor. Um, so we have not yet um, had a proposal for those funds. So those funds remain in the second commitment in principle pool. We have a motion. Dr. Ward. I move to recommend to the Board of Directors the attached project amendments for 2022 to 2025 uh, TIP. Second. Dr. Wheel. Second. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 And oppose nay. Thank you very much. Okay, we now return to the informational briefings. Uh, number seven, RTD Northwest Rail Peak Service Study. And once again, we have Jake, Jacob Rieger, Multimodal Transportation Planning Manager. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I have the easy job this time, which is just to introduce our speaker. But um, on this topic, I think many of you or most of you are aware that RTD um, and its stakeholders have been working hard on a peak period service Peak, peak service study for Northwest Rail um, to look at the feasibility of implementing peak service on in the full length of the Northwest Rail corridor. So we thought it was timely to give you an update on where, uh, where the study is, uh, what's been done, and what's upcoming. So with that, let me introduce Patrick Stanley, Project Manager from RTD. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, Chair and uh, uh, directors, thank you for le uh, letting us come and present here today. Uh, and I realize some of you have probably seen this before, and for those, for those who have, I apologize that you get a look at me again um, as I go through this. But um, it's important, I think, to get this information out to as many people as possible about, about what we're trying to do on the study. And get this right. There we go. So I'll start with a brief overview of the Northwest Rail. So the, the Northwest Rail was um, part of the 2004 Fast Tracks vote. Um, the, what we're looking at is a 35-mile extension that goes beyond the six miles, which was opened as part of the B line um, in 2016. So the B line includes, um, it's, that is a, a dedicated RTD track that runs on an overhead electrified system. Um, the, the 35 extend, extended miles from the Westminster, current Westminster Station at 72nd Lowell all the way up to Longmont um, is proposed to run on BNSF freight tracks, which is unique to RTD. Uh, we, we don't have any other, um, any of our, our other rail systems that run on freight tracks. Uh, so a little bit about the history. So right now we're looking at the peak service. A little bit about the history. Uh, again, I mentioned in 2004, it was, it was uh, uh, included as part of the fast tracks vote. 2010, we did the environmental evaluation uh, that particular study looked at 55 trips per day, uh, full service, 11 new stations. Um, and at that time, it was, you know, due to a lack of a de dedicated funding source, it wasn't able to be implemented at that time. So in 2013, uh, we went into the NAM study, the Northwest Area Mobility Study. That really looked at um, doing the Northwest Rail in segments, uh, full service segments along the corridor. But as a result of that study, it was determined that the uh, Northwest Rail was a long-term, more of a long-term study, and RTD committed to continued study um, and evaluation and continued updates um, on progress. So 2016, as I mentioned, the B-Line opened. Um, that's uh, from Denver Union Station to the Westminster Station at 72nd and Lowell. And then in 2017, really the peak service concept started, uh, started uh, coming to the front. So what is peak service? So peak service uh, really consists of three weekday uh, morning trips from, from Longmont to Denver and three weekday evening trips from uh, Denver back to Longmont. Uh, we're also looking at, part, we're partnering with our local jurisdictions in the area to, uh, to plan six new stations uh, along the alignment. Uh, we're looking to identify a feasible location for a maintenance facility up in Longmont. Um, and that's because we don't, we won't have the, we won't have the same commuter rail technology that we do on the rest of the system for this particular corridor. Uh, we're coordinating with the BNSF. They're a major partner. Obviously, we run on their tracks, so um, we're kind of beholden to, to them on, on uh, what we can do. Uh, and we're evaluating potential train technologies. I want to note that it is not um, part of the study's intent to actually pick a specific 
vehicle type. What we're looking at is looking at the market, trying to find out what vehicles are available that meet our operational needs. And then, uh, we're, of course, we're, we're continuing to explore opportunities with uh, partners uh, along the alignment, and uh, in particular, Front Range Passenger Rail. So I mentioned we have six new stations. Um, moving from the south, going up to the north, uh, those are downtown Westminster, uh, Broomfield 116th, Flatiron, downtown Louisville, Boulder Junction and Depot Square, and downtown Longmont. So while we're leading the study, we're not, we're not going at this alone. Uh, I want to recognize that we do have a, uh, um, a lot of partners in the area, a lot of interest, uh, the people that have been engaged for quite some time. Uh, everybody you see here on the screen it makes up our study advisory team, our, our SAT. Um, and, you know, collectively we want to try, to try to realize a reliable and connected transportation network in the Northwest area. So peak service, uh, the feasibility, and you know, why, why is this something that, that is attractive to take a look at now? Uh, you know, given the fact that we have limited resources, uh, a peak service is a way that we could possibly get service to the Northwest area sooner rather than later. Uh, it's a more cost-effective approach since we're not building out the entire infrastructure for uh, full service. Um, we can uh, pursue funding for a full-day service as we provide a starter service. Uh, it accomplishes a lot of tra track upgrades and safety upgrades um, that lay the foundation for future expansion. Um, it is something that has happened in other urban areas, peak services um, that people have implemented or agent agencies have implemented, and uh, they've been able to grow as, uh, as ridership demand grows. And then uh, it'll help us address some of the ridership demands of today while we continue to plan for future expansion. So here's the big question is when, when will the train come to, to the community? And the, right now we're in a feasibility, this is a feasibility study. So there is no plan set date for when the train service would, would uh, come to the Northwest area. What we're trying, what we are working on as part of this uh, feasibility study is really determining what, what are the track infrastructure um, improvements? What do we need to put in place in order to make peak service uh, a reality? And what we want to, what we're trying to identify what we refer to as a common set of facts. What are the costs? Uh, what are the, uh, what is the, what are the design costs? What are the construction costs? The operations costs associated with running a peak service? What are the benefits and impacts? Uh, what is the ridership projection? Um, and then what kind of strategic partnerships are out there that we can possibly tap into? Um, and then of course we're through this whole process, we're, we're trying to identify potential funding sources uh, to help us move this forward. So on the study, study schedule, this, this schedule that you see in front of you here shows kind of wrapping up towards the, the end of this year um, it, it, for, our, for our study consultant. Uh, we've always projected that it would probably be kind of first of this year for RTD to kind of wrap up its total uh, study piece. Um, it's a five milestone process. Uh, milestones one and two are really fact-finding milestones. You know, what's been built out there? What has happened in the community since 2010? What do we need to plan for? Um, you know, that, that, uh, that changes, uh, that has changed since then. Um, you know, what does our new reality look like in the area? Um, so we've gone through those pieces. We're currently in milestone three, which is really defining the, kind of towards the tail end of milestone three, which is defining what the peak service footprint really looks like. What are the stations? You know, where are the sightings? You know, what, what is the configuration of the, of the uh, system look like? Uh, and then from there, we're going to jump into milestones four and five, where we'll start looking at service options, potential partnerships and um, operational strategies and next steps. I will note um, just to kind of uh, let everybody know that we've got, we're working with the BNSF right now. We have an agreement with the BNSF um, to do some 30% basic engineering plans and some cost estimating, uh, which is obviously a very important fact for our study. That process is on a little bit different time scale right now. It took us a little bit longer to get that agreement than we were hoping it would take. Um, so we are currently reevaluating our schedule with our consultant team just a little bit and see how that meshes out because we need to make sure that those facts that we get from the BNSF are captured uh, appropriately in the study. So I want to touch real quick on the, the community outreach, our last community outreach, uh, which has been a, uh, been a while now. It's been uh, January and February. Uh, we had our first uh, open house January 31st in Boulder and our second open house February 2nd in Westminster. Uh, together, we had about a little less than 200 attendants uh, in person uh, in those two events. Uh, we had a total of about 30 or so comment cards that were filled out, filled out in the 
in the meeting itself, but we, we encourage people to go and uh, do the, uh, visit the website and do the online meeting. The online meeting was the exact same content as what the uh, in-person meeting was. And it ran from just before the open houses to about two weeks after the open houses. And in those, we got about 3,300 comments, our total views, what we call the engaged views, where people actually went in and clicked around and tried to find information out. Had about 170 or so surveys completed. And then about uh, 350, um, give or take, um, visits to the RT website, uh, sign up for comment, or people that left comments and signed up for emails. So right after the, those open houses, uh, we sat down with our SAT and said, okay, what do we think we heard um, you know, collectively from the comments that we received when we were there in the meeting? And uh, in general, uh, you know, were a lot of people, I think, expressed that maybe the peak service is not necessarily going to work for me opening uh, in the peak service operation, but we're excited to see what it could be, what it could expand to be. Um, there were some concerns about reverse commutes um, and possible additional stations in Gum Barrel, Niwot area in particular. Uh, potential partnerships, what, a, what would a partnership look like with Front Range Passenger Rail and BNSF? Um, you know, what, was the what is the cost differential between peak service and a full service scenario, which obviously that's the purpose of our study is to figure out what, uh, what the peak service cost impacts are. Um, we had quite a few concerns about service for customers with non-traditional commutes. Uh, maybe people in the service industry or hospitality that, that perhaps don't commute on a traditional um, commute like, like uh, probably most of us here in this room do. Um, some concern about growth around the station. Uh, you know, what, is that, what does that look like? What is the nature of that? Uh, what is the planning for that? Um, are there going to be any stresses on the uh, existing infrastructure uh, around the stations? And of course, kind of the bottom one here is, you know, so what, what happens if, you know, if this is not, turns out to not be feasible? So then we were able to actually take a look at the comments that we got themselves and kind of double check, gut check us, you know, did, did, we, did we kind of hear correctly from what, from what people's concerns were? And um, again, general positivity and overall about the study, um, I think kind of a reserved excitement, I guess I would call it, that we are continuing the exploration of the Northwest Rail um, and, uh, you know, looking towards trying to figure out how we can, how we can uh, satisfy the commitments uh, that we've made. Um, the station areas, uh, again, locations and additions, again, Niwot and Gum Barrel were the ones that kind of came, came to the front the most. Um, other topics, integrated service options. So how does the Northwest Rail integrate with existing RTD service and local uh, services in the area? And uh, there was a little bit of concern too. So if the, North, if the Northwest Rail comes, are we going to lose potentially some service somewhere? So those are some questions there. Uh, questions about land use, again, uh, is this, you know, what is the nature of this? Are these around stations in particular? Are they public or more private development? Uh, you know what, and we definitely heard some concerns about existing residents possibly being pushed out around the station areas. And we did hear quite a bit about construction, which obviously we're in a study study stage at this point. So the construction is a ways off, but if it does move forward, that is obviously uh, considerations we need to we need to be aware of. So we did ask a couple questions on surveys. Uh, this one is uh, please select uh, all the reasons why the service maybe wouldn't would not meet your needs. Um, and, uh, you know, I think uh, these really kind of resolve around, revolve a lot around what the nature of peak service is. Uh, so kind of the first one on here is need weekend service as an example. Um, and then, uh, you know, midday service coming back, uh, reverse commutes, um, some things like that that weren't, really aren't part of the uh, peak service um, plan as we have it defined. Uh, and then finally, kind of towards the end, uh, you know, the proposed route doesn't really necessarily uh, serve where we, where we want it to be. And then this one, uh, what, you know, what do you see as the benefits of the peak service uh, rail plans? And I was encouraged by this one, frankly, that, that there's a pretty high, high bar for a lot of these, kind of, I think, indicating that there's many different reasons why, why people could utilize the, the service. Um, but a lot of these, you know, number one, being stuck in traffic, uh, vehicle emissions, obviously, that's one that we've heard about. Um, you know, there's a big push right now to try to eliminate um, or reduce a lot of that. Uh, transportation opportunities, and it goes from that, you know, being able to read and relax on the train. Uh, and then finally, kind of towards the end is really the cost, personal cost for, uh, for vehicles, uh, you know, parking costs and gas costs for, for, uh, for cars. 
So this one is the uh, maintenance facility. We did ask, um, you know, what, what type of concerns should we be aware of and look into for maintenance facilities that, that somebody might be uh, concerned with. Um, a lot of people that answered this particular survey don't actually live around the, uh, the proposed uh, maintenance facility locations. However, I think the comments are still appropriate and um, they're still kind of what we would expect to see, uh, noise impacts, air quality impacts, uh, traffic disruption, um, and then kind of rounding out towards the bottom at more of a visual impact uh, concerns. So a little bit on the next step. So we're going to continue to find the initial footprint of the stations. Uh, we're working with the BNSF right now on the freight, uh, freight rail sightings. Uh, we had a very good productive meeting with the BNSF yesterday. Uh, as a matter of fact, where we were talking about where those freight sightings are, how long they are, the number that they are. Uh, they've given us some information in 2017, but we, some of those aren't great locations siding wise. Uh, they have disruptions to um, some roadways and some things like that. But I was encouraged to see that the BNSF is open to looking at those locations, I think, and, and working with us uh, to make it a more um, uh, accessible and more, um, you know, appropriate uh, siding locations that don't have as much interference. Uh, we're going to use the public input we got from, from the public meetings um, and online still currently um, on the study webpage to uh, refine our base footprint. Uh, we need to take that input we need to use that seriously and, and see what, uh, what we can possibly accommodate and do uh, for some of that input. Uh, we're continuing to compile the draft set of common, or the common set of facts. Uh, that is something that's going to happen, I think, throughout the entirety of the study until um, we get to the end uh, to compile all those pieces, the costs and the, uh, the numbers. Um, we did an update to the RTD board in, in April. We're looking at doing the next one in the August, September, uh, or say late summer, early fall timeframe. Uh, for the next RTD board update. And then right now we're going to be doing a lot of uh, summer um, pop-up events. Uh, it, so what we really want to do is target um, really some, maybe some underrepresented communities. So we want to try to reach out with our pop-up events towards more cultural type events so that we can get a little bit broader view of than the, maybe the people that typically show up to the open houses. Um, so in those pop-up events, we want to try to go through specifically the stations that might be served by the area that we're at. Um, want to talk about, uh, you know, general broad ideas of what a siding uh, impact could possibly be to that community. And, and we just want to hear, um, you know, hear from the community. We hope that this will get our, get our word out there even further, uh, get more input back from the community. Um, so I think, um, I think that pretty much covers it. I will uh, be happy to answer any questions anybody has. Colby. I think I pushed the wrong button. There we go. Um, I happen to also be on the Front Range Passenger Rail Board. Yeah. And the question that comes to mind for me is, aside from the wonderful synergies that you could have in partnerships, how do you, how do, what's the plan to reconcile the different propulsion mechanisms? For example, the current RTD operates on the electrified system and BNSF operates on diesel. Is, is, what is, is there a plan for, do they have they reconcile that? Uh, well, I, first, I, I, we don't necessarily have to reconcile per se with what the BNSF is running. Uh, we're running, um, you know, the, they're running their technology, we're, we'll, we'll be running ours. And, and really, in theory, the front race passenger rail could, could run a different technology than we do as well. But what I would say is I think when we start to look at the front range passenger rail and RTD, you know, one of the, one of the struggles I think that we're going to have from a peak service standpoint is we're not going to, we would not purchase a large fleet if we were to, uh, if this were to move forward into the next step. Um, and I think that's an interesting opportunity with front range passenger rail that there could be a possible joint purchase type agreement that we could do. Um, you know, we're still looking at uh, what I would say is we haven't eliminated any technology from our standpoint necessarily, except for an overhead electrified uh, vehicle. And that's because we have clearance issues along the corridor. Battery technology, hydrogen technology, it's new, it's emerging. Uh, we don't want to rule it out, um, but we also at this point can't really rule out diesel because if, if, if this were to happen relatively quickly, diesel is still very much into the, in, in play. Um, I don't know if that, that, that hopefully that answers your, your question. 
hundred percent. It's it's a the idea that the electrified can operate on the diesel and the um, the fast tracks can operate on the the electrified can operate on a diesel line as well as the diesel line can be used fast tracks is what I was looking to hear and that's wonderful. Right. Yeah, we don't want a technology that precludes, you know, one of the others. Executive Director Johnson, it looked like you, you wanted to say something. Well, no, I think Mr. Stanley answered the question very well, but Director Mulvey, just to uh, further expound, yes, it's all about the infrastructure. And so as we look at potential partnerships of Front Range Passenger Rail, it's like, what can we do to optimize the opportunities before us? So if, in fact, there was some connectivity relative to um, the Northwest Passenger Rail with connectivity to Front Range Passenger Rail that can con continue on throughout the state, then that's there. Um, as Patrick made reference to, it's really about having our studies aligned so then we can determine the best path forward. So I don't want to get too far out in front of myself, but I have been having conversations, of course, with our executive director of Front Range Passenger Rail. Our teams have been conferring as well. So we want to ensure that we're being intentional in the approach uh, to the point that was raised so we're not eliminating any propulsion systems because there's a lot of things that are evolving currently where there's a hybrid system that could operate as batteries versus hydrogen. Hydrogen is electric, but there's all these different elements. So it really is contingent upon the partnership with BNSF, recognizing that as a freight corridor and what might we do to ensure efficiencies with the sidings and things of the like. A couple of people in queue, uh, Director Ward, then Director Broom, and then Director Shaw. Mr. Ward. Chair. Um, for r &E, what does cost prohibitive mean? dollar amount that you guys have identified that you don't want to of I would say that we don't necessarily have that defined at this point so what we're trying to do as part of our study is really determine um, you know what are those costs what are the facts associated with peak service and um, you know we'll take that to the decision makers and um, you know see see what that see what that looks like um, I don't we don't have a set number that we're aiming at necessarily we're trying to find out just realistically what is the cost to actually do this and what does that look like for us and is that something that can happen or um you know what are the next steps beyond that um from your from rtd's previous experience building out a rail network what percentage of cost is let's say station development and design compared to other construction costs related to the line itself you know, I wish I might have to get back to you on that, what the actual percentage is. I don't know what the percentage is necessarily. Um, I have some historical, but it's probably somewhat dated at this point, cost of what a station kind of platform build out would be. Um, but I, I don't know, it's kind of dated, so I don't know that I would necessarily want to <laughs> throw it out there and get people uh, caught up on that number. So it's probably not accurate anymore. It's, it's pre-pandemic and pre-inflation and yes, of course. all that good stuff, so <laughs> no worries. Sure. Um, and then I guess my last question, I know you guys didn't really have a defined timeline as to it up and running. I know Front Range Passenger Rail, some people have been trying to push for a 2024 ballot initiative. I don't know if that's going to happen or not, but whatever the case may be, if, um, let's just say Front Range Passenger Rail does get operating sooner, as RTD thought about just contracting to Front Range Passenger Rail to provide the service and use the fast track funds to buy up service per se to meet that contractual obligation that you guys have with the voters. Ms. Johnson looks like she's interested in chiming in. May let her do it. Yes, if I may. So thank you very much, uh, Director Ward, for the question. Going back, it's really incumbent upon us to get a common set of facts because right now everything is on the table. And so as you talk about could there be an opportunity, absolutely. We could leverage a joint powers authority. Many uh, different transit agencies across the country have done that to deliver service, especially when you look at inner city passenger rail and recognizing we're a regional transportation agency. So everything is on the table, but first we have to discern where we are, what is a stopgap measure if, in fact, inner city passenger rail is different from, you know, uh, regional transit. So there could be different funding opportunities relative to working through um, funding strategies with the Federal Railroad Administration as a form of grant funding. 
So right now, really, I wouldn't say like the sky's the limit in reference to options. I don't mean funding. I mean options. And so as we look at that going forward, I think that's where we are to explore. So we're not cutting off our nose to spite our faces, but trying to ensure that we're moving people because I think the vast majority of people in this region and beyond really don't care who the operator is. They just want to get to where they need to go when they want to get there, right? And so that's what we're looking at. And so, Mr. Stanley, I don't know if you wanted to add anything else to that. That's good. That's a better answer than I probably would have given. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Great That's question. Great question, though. Thank you. I had a question on ridership. Uh, the number dedicated for COVID, after COVID. That's a very good question. Um, right now, we have we have based our our uh, information on um, previous to COVID numbers, and and part of that is we don't necessarily have the few. The, I think the the total picture of after, what is COVID and after COVID. Um, so we've kind of used them based on the, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, Brian, because um, I know Brian, Brian was the one that worked on it here. Um, but that, that's what we based it on because those are kind of the best numbers that we have at this, at this stage that I think will reflect more of what the future, uh, the future uh, ridership is going to look like. That likely to be updated after yeah, I would imagine it will be. Yeah, it will be updated at some point. I, I don't know the timing of that um, necessarily. I don't know if probably have a lot of folks, Dr. Cog here, that might have a pretty good thought on when that is. Moving up, Dr. Shaw. Thank you. Um, I this kind of goes back to Director Ward and Director Mulvey's questions. Um, would we consider, um, uh, you know, kind of swapping out for a diesel engine that is leased from BSNF, BNSF? Um, I, uh, it might make more financial sense to test the uh, numbers that that would be interested in a service like this and. Um, you know, I, I'm just trying to think of ways that might be cost effective in terms of trying to gauge the interest and uh, therefore more able to make a financial commitment based on the amount of interest if, uh, if that were possible. I don't know if a freight engine is different than a passenger. They're very different. Okay. Um, sorry. <laughs> so never mind. <laughs> yeah, you swap out. Yeah, right. Yeah, they used to do that. I lived in outside of New York, and my dad commuted, and they swapped from electric to diesel at the beginning of the suburbs. I, it's a great question. I, I don't. Yeah, that, that's an excellent question. Um, w one thing I would say. Um, we are, we are talking to the BNSF right now, and you know, one of the questions is, is how is it operated? Do we operate it ourselves? Do we contract with the BNSF to operate it? Is it potentially with Amtrak? And you know, for, there's a lot of different ways that these can be operated. From a locomotive standpoint, just to address that, is what we do have a restriction between DUS and Westminster Station, and that our bridges that we built uh, for that for the B line are not. Uh, what I would call freight rated, um, which is which which is called E80 loading. Um, they're they're really more uh, conservative, or they're kind of more towards what our commuter rail vehicle is. We did add a little bit in there, so we can run some some locomotives, but they're lighter locomotives than what the freight typically uses. So that would be a, a, a um, that would be prohibitive um, to run a freight locomotive over the same bridge infrastructure that we that we have during that through that first segment from DUS. A good question. All great questions. Executive Director Rex. Thank you, sir, very much. Um, to the question related to ridership and travel patterns and the like, uh, Dr. Cog, we are participating in a household travel survey right now, or is it done? Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, over the next year. So we'll be updating our regional travel demand forecasting model here in the next couple, three years, right, to participate in that. So what we do know coming out of COVID is that certainly, you know, the types of trips have changed, right? I mean, your traditional work-based trip is probably not what it was pre-COVID, but 
the number of other trips has significantly increased. And it will be interesting, you know, as as we go forward with this study to see, you know, what, you know, what the demand would be for this type of service to, to fulfill the need of those trips, right? So anyway, that's... That wasn't my question. I did have a question, though. First of all, I'm so I'm I'm excited for this study. I want to thank CEO Johnson and the RTD board for their willingness to take this on. I think it's uh, it's significant for for the residents in our northwest corridor. Um, how many how many freight trains a day run on this it's, corridor? It's like four to five. Um, one of the crossings, um, I don't remember which one it was now. Uh, we did get kind of a survey on it. I think it was 4.7 trains a day on average. Uh, it's not a lot. Yeah. It's, it's definitely reduced uh, quite a bit from what it was even 10 years ago. And um, how much of the corridor is double-tracked, if any? Very little. Uh, there's a little bit by Boulder. Um, you know, I don't know the mileage of it. Um, there's a little bit kind of by the Broomfield 116th. Okay. Station in there. Uh, the BNSF, um, interestingly enough, has done some infrastructure improvements. Uh, we kind of went over a lot of those yesterday in our BNSF meeting, where they've actually built bridges uh, for second tracking um, in quite a number of places, uh, which we want to look at. Obviously, those could be good potential siting locations that don't block roadways uh, and that sort of thing. So they haven't done a lot of double tracking. Uh, so it's, you know, I, I pretty much consider this a for the most part, a single track corridor. Um, my last question, maybe it's more of a comment um, related to, I was interested to see some of the survey results that you showed and and those wanting, you know, service, midday service and the like. And I'm, I'm encouraged that BNSF has showed a willingness to come to the table because it's not always been the case, right? I mean, I'm not necessarily at BNSF. I was in Oklahoma City and we were working on a, on a peak hour service on a UP corridor, and it was like pulling teeth. It was unbelievable. But um, so, so that's encouraging. And I think, you know, it's all about comfort, right? So, I mean, if you can get this to work with BNSF with the three inbound trains in the morning and the like, maybe there is a conversation at some time in the future about doing mid midday right. service. Because I know, like, TRE in the Dallas Fort Worth area, um, it just works seamless, I think. I mean, I've used that corridor quite a bit through the years. and and um, yeah, so I'm I'm excited about it and appreciate all the work you're doing. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's um, I will say the being so far, yes, we're we're it was a great it was a great meeting yesterday. Don't you? <laughs> yeah, knock on wood. Um, yeah, one thing I would mention, I think I think if if this were to move forward and we and we did uh, get to a peak service, I do think probably the the next stages are probably incremental. I, I can't imagine in a situation where we would jump straight from peak service to a 55 round trips a day. Um, so I think, you know, that'll, that'll be continued conversations with the BNSF if that, if that scenario, um, you know, is realized. So. Great. Thank you very much. We appreciate the presentation. Thank you. Appreciate it. Can do anything? That we will move into administrative items. And just so I don't forget, this is our hero right here. Cam has the parking passes. So remember those. And we'll go to reports. First of all, CDOTs. Oh, thank you. Mr. Stewart. Thanks. I'll start and then I'll pass it over to uh, to Commissioner Holgain and uh, Commissioner Adams. First of all, sorry we were late. Uh, we took the express lanes um, down from about 144th um, and uh, about, uh, oh, I would say, say 88th, uh, the express lane stopped and everybody else kept going. Uh, once you're in those express lanes, you can't get out. And we never did see any reason why those express lanes didn't function well. And I don't come down enough to know if that's a current um, issue or not, but oh, for heaven's sake, no, <laughs> pay extra money to be caught in traffic. That being said, I'm the vice chair of a CTIO. <laughs> I'll, I'll ask myself why that happened. Um, and so my report today is mainly about CTIO changes. So as you remember, HPTE is the original name for us. We retain that, but we really call ourselves CTIO now. 
And uh, Nick Farber, who has been with HPTE CTIO for 11 years, um, has left CTIO, and we are in recruitment for a new executive director of CTIO. Uh, Nick had an opportunity to, he's a young guy, had an opportunity to uh, do something else with his career. And we're really going to miss him because we have a lot of stuff uh, that has to happen in the next couple of years that we're we're dealing with. We have a lot of toll roads that are coming on. We have some uh, dynamic uh, pricing models that we're going to try. We're going to do a new back office um, system so that we're not reliant on E470. They're a toll road. We're much more than a toll road. We have all kinds of programs. You know, we have the Central 70 Equity Tolling Program. We have uh, bi-directional tolls. We have HOV that has to be considered. We have the Mountain Express Lines. We, we're a very different animal, and we need to get that data in order to be able to function um, efficiently, effectively, and make that toll revenue work for CDOT uh, so that we can uh, provide that safety and efficiency and not... Uh, rely on taxpayers to do it, but rely on users of the system. So that being said, Nick is is gone and we are recruiting for a new uh, CDOT director. Uh, you may have read that uh, C-470 toll uh, revenue is not uh, maximized the way we thought it would be. We did a traffic and revenue study before COVID. We had a two-year delay in getting C-470 built. And during that time, then, of course, we had COVID hit. And then it's a very white collar area where people are now working from home. And so while we have the money with revenue, uh, with the toll revenues to pay the bonds that are due from the loans, we don't have the money for operations and maintenance. And we went to CDOT and asked for um, a $4 million loan uh, to cover operations and maintenance for the next several years. Uh, that, that's unfortunate, but I think I'm telling you this because of the change in commuting patterns. The things that were true prior to COVID are no longer true. And uh, people's, um, people's desire to uh, either get in carpools with each other or get onto a bus, any of those other things have changed drastically. And when you look at uh, how many people in the Denver metro region in all areas are working from home, where the heck is everybody going every morning if they're not going to work? I, I just don't understand this because the roads are packed. And on I-25, which I'm most familiar with, you know, our numbers are back up there. They're back up there. Uh, so wanted to tell you about that. Also wanted to tell you, you might have read in today's paper or saw in the news that the Mountain Express Lanes uh, tolls will be starting to be enforced. Uh, we have a month that starts Wednesday. We'll have a month when we'll forgive you if you get in there at the wrong time, if you pull a trailer, if you're speeding, if you're weaving, you're going to get uh, a notice, but then you're going to get a big fine. And uh, we are able to do that because we've partnered with Blissway, which is a company out of California uh, that we have been doing a pilot with. And uh, they will be able to grab the data immediately and uh, then um, make sure that we penalize the people who are doing what they're not supposed to be doing. And it's a system of um, trans transponders or something along the roadway, and we can move them as we need to. And if it's uh, as successful as we hope it will be, we're going to put these on other uh, roads as well. And I'm pleased to say... Uh, I-25 North at segment two and three, which is like between you know, um, 58th and um, 120th, we're going to use that as well to try and eliminate some of the safety issues that are causing crashes every single day. So we're doing everything we can on that one. Um, then I also want to say that uh, the Department of Transit and Rail has been without an executive director, or I guess we just call them directors, at CDOT uh, for a number of months now. And there should be a, an announcement coming up soon about the appointment of a new um, director for the Department of Transit and Rail. That'll be exciting. And then finally, just wanted to say we're going to have several, we have several vacancies on the Transportation Commission. It may change significantly. It may change not significantly. We have 11 members of the Transportation Commission that are appointed by the governor throughout the state of Colorado. We have three vacancies now that, that need to be filled, and there are three that are existing directors or 
transportation commissioners who are up for reappointment. Uh, we thought those appointments would be done by this month because in in, in uh, July is when we have the switchover. So watch this space, and we'll see what happens when the uh, governor can make those appointments. And now I'll pass the mic over to uh, Commissioner. Can, can I interrupt just real oh, yeah. briefly? We love our acronyms, and early in your presentation, you oh, said sorry. several times CTIO. For anybody listening or anybody here that doesn't know, can you just briefly? Colorado Transportation Investment Office. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. Sorry. We're going to test you at the end. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Stewart. That was very thorough. I think the only thing that I will add is that um, the CDOT team and the ad hoc committee continue to work to fine-tune the fee-based right-of-way for fiber access. Um, this continues to be a conversation about the role that CDOT plays or can play and will play um, in in, in providing access to the rest of the state. And so we've had some uh, several conversations about it, and we had a proposed resolution that was actually pulled from the last meeting because we continue to get feedback from the public and from industry. Um, and so we'll continue to get comments and continue to um, consider them as we fine-tune and finalize the proposed resolution. So anything else, Commissioner Adams? I think both of you uh, covered uh, all the things that uh, we've discussed in our last commission meeting. And the only only point I would uh, continue to uh, emphasize is we're very concerned about safety on our roads within the CDOT meetings, and we continue to make it a focal point. And it's uh, certainly at the forefront of all the things we discussed during our meetings and a priority of how we make decisions about the things that we're doing going forward. Commissioners, appreciate that. Any questions for the CDOT folks? Okay, we'll move on to RTD report. CEO Johnson. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I'll start and then yield the floor to anybody on our collective team that would like to add. So first and foremost, on Thursday, June 22nd at 10 a.m., we will be kicking off our second year for Zero Fear for Better Air with a media um, uh, event. It'll be held at Denver Union Station near Track 7. For those that may be unfamiliar, this is the second year with a program in which we uh, basically partner with the state of Colorado, specifically the Colorado Energy Office. And during the months this year of July and August, there will be zero fare with the hopes of creating better air, but I would like to coin it as we are trying to entice people to try transit so they change their travel patterns and hopefully we'll garner a transit customer going forward. Um, secondly, I wanted to note next Tuesday, a week from today, June 27th, coming before the RTD Board of Directors for their consideration will be Respect the Ride, which is our code of conduct, more or less its behaviors and guidelines we expect of people utilizing our system. And in tandem, there will be um, a suspension policy for their consideration. Just for everyone's edification, um, over the course of 60 days, it commenced April 3rd through June 2nd, we did an extensive outreach um, initiative, and we basically were able to uh, garner about 1,700 individual surveys relative to respecting the ride. And along with those 1,700 um, survey responses, 800 individuals provided free-flowing comments relative to our system. So one thing's for certain, I don't want to let the cat out of the bag, but people do see a need to respect the ride. And it'll be interesting to see because most people would make an assumption about what the biggest issue is that they saw. Um, in some categories, for customers, it was one thing. For our employees, it was something else. And for the community at large, that may be getting information um, relative to third parties via the media or something, it varied. Um, but I, I think that this gives us an opportunity as we try to encourage people to leverage or utilize transit, that really we're trying to emphasize the value that public transit brings over volume, because once we showcase the value, the volume will come because you'll have promoters. That's just my own personal opinion, does not reflect that of the Regional Transportation District. 
Okay. Moving on to the next item I'd like to talk about as we talk about value over volume, um, light rail service. Um, we are aware that we've had some disruptions, and I want to qualify that for everybody here. Recognizing that we have a system, our light rail system basically opened up in 1994. And while we heard from Mr. Stanley about um, Northwest Rail Peak Study in relationship to fast tracks, we were in this mode of building, building, building. Well, now we have to invest in the infrastructure that we have. And so um, there's been a lot of coverage in the media about the service disruptions, but I just want to take an opportunity to explain what we're doing. We are um, we have work going on along the E-line corridor, specifically what are called coping panels. There's the caps that go on top of the sound walls. In order for us to do that, we basically have to ensure that we protect our workers and our, con our contractors. And so what we're doing is we are single tracking an operation bi-directionally. And what I mean by that, it's no different if you had some roadway work and there's one lane of traffic going in both directions and you have a flagger that's out. So what we have done is basically increase the headways for 30 minutes. Are there going to be glitches? Of course. But we're trying to utilize our systems, i.e. SCADA, which is supervisory control and data acquisition as we go forward um, to ensure that people are in a safe uh work right passage. And so going forward, there's going to be additional work. I've said this to the board where we have to invest in our assets so we can continue with them for generations to come. So um, with that, I will yield the floor to any member of RTD that would like to add anything else to this report. Thank you. Thank you, RTC. Just a couple of things to supplement the call for partner call for projects partnership program is currently open uh, we are getting a quite a bit of interest from the five sub regional councils as you all recall this is a project whose administration is actually programmed similar to the way dr cog does and we're really excited about some of the stakeholder based programs and and activities that that are coming forward the other i'll highlight is we uh we also have out for bid right now the zero emission fleet and facilities transition plan, which we're looking forward to getting going later this year. Sure. I'm going to follow up with what GM CEO Johnson talked about, the respect the ride code of conduct and, and what we refer to generally as creating a welcome environment. And hats off to our staff. They've done great work. Our, our chief of police and Deputy Chief of Tremendous Work. You know, a while back, Denver Union Station was in the news all the time. What a terrible place. It's not a welcoming transit environment. You don't hear any of that anymore. And that's because they've they've done their job and, and, and it's a great place to be and fighting. It, it, people are reluctant to ru ride transit because of safety concerns. They're not going to ride transit. So uh, hats off to, to staff and GMCO Johnson, all their hard work. Great strides. Okay, thank you. Question. Uh, I came down Thursday for some little tiny event that was downtown, myself and about, <laughs> what, three-quarter of a million of my closest friends. Uh, I took RTV. I took light rail down. Do you have any feel for was there a bump that day? I mean, how how did things? Any no? I mean, I'm I, I, I'm just curious if you've got any any information for us. So uh, as relates to ridership numbers, quite naturally, we do have some contracted service, so it takes us some time to compile. But anecdotally, yes. Um, as we uh, saw, like, park and ride lots had a lot more people utilizing them. We assume they were getting on the system, but we won't have those numbers for certain until later. But we do know on our consists, I'm sorry, those are rail cars that create what we call a train, but in my world, we call them a consist. Um, they were pretty much full uh, during the course of the day and throughout. Um, so yes, anecdotally, yes, most definitely a bump, I would say. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Uh, no, any questions for RTD before we move on? Uh, our RAC representative is not here, so no report from RAC. Uh, anything else from staff before we? I did. Um, oh, I was just driving that day. So. Oh, yes. <laughs> so you were, you were reliving the experience. Yeah, okay. <laughs> 
So your data is not anecdotal. <laughs> no, I have firsthand knowledge. I took a lot of people. I'm sure you did. Thank you all very much. I, I just wanted to share with the partners in the room um, about uh, some housing initiatives that Dr. Cog is going to be taking on over the next year or so. So coming out of the last legislative session, as you all know, housing was front and center. Uh, most notably with Senate Bill 213, or the bill that shall not be mentioned. <laughs> but that's what I forgot. <laughs> um, no, but if, but if nothing else, it certainly did elevate the conversation. And, you know, we uh, timing is everything in this business, of course. And we had the Dr. Cog board retreat uh, right after the session ended. And we talked all day about housing. And out of that, um, out of that retreat and then at the board work session earlier this month, um, we have gotten, you know, ultimately we'll bring it to the board for approval to move forward, but we think we know the, uh, you know, kind of what the atmosphere in the room is, and we're planning on um, uh, being proactive in our approach and creating a regional housing strategy for this, for, for this area. Um, we're going to kind of do that in two phases, one from now through the end of the year, and then after that, we believe the the actual strategy will take 18 months to two years to totally complete. But we really are interested in being able to have enough data points um, and information by the end of this year in order to inform the legislature about ways in which they can help us local governments um, yeah, wrap our head around this whole housing issue. We want to change the conversation. Um, be quite honest with you from, you know, being dictated by the legislature about how, how local government should handle housing to having a, a truly collaborative conversation. Um, so we're excited about that. We're planning on bringing an item to the board next month, um, approving a UPWP request or a unified planning work program request to allow us to move forward with that. And we'll be getting a, a consultant on, uh, rather quickly after that and moving. So um, we'll keep you all in the loop. I'm sure there will be updates to the RTC as we move forward. Commissioner Stewart. Commissioner Stewart. Thank you. Oh, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Doug. You know, um, this is not going to go away, nor should it. Uh, but um, I'm wondering if you're also having the Metro Mayor's Caucus as a stakeholder, and as you know, Heidi Williams, former mayor of Thornton, just got appointed as the uh, executive director. And what's thrilling about that is she's she's been a mayor, <laughs> and she has had to deal with these kinds of things. And I think as that Metro Mayor's Caucus begins to um, coalesce around something, you know, we were very um, organized on fast tracks. We were very organized on water, um, energy. So this, I think, will be a point that they'll they'll want to grab onto and um, help with that data that you're looking for um, and some of the policies that are uh, from their jurisdiction. So thanks for dealing with that. It's a, it's a Yes, no, thank you, um, Director, for that. Yes, yeah, so actually, I had to sit down with Heidi last week. She hasn't lost any energy, in case you were wondering. She's all, she's excited to get going, so they obviously will be a very important partner for us, as well as CCI and CML. Um, I've had conversations with both, uh, both those agencies or associations, and uh, they're like, listen, Doug, whatever you need to help you know, communicate this message and really help with our membership, we're happy to do that. I, I think, you know, if nothing else, the last legislative session has really provided an opportunity for, um, you know, for several of those associations that kind of deal in the same business, right, to really coalesce around an issue. So um, we're really excited about this. We have part of our, um, our part of our strategy, our, our process will be a very engaged, comprehensive stakeholder process. Um, knowing that it's going to move fast, but, you know, anybody and everybody it, uh, who wants to be involved within it will be. Stuart. If I could just say one more thing. Um, you may not know, but our own Jessica Holguin um, is on uh, Mayor Leck Johnson's uh, transition team. So look to her for a resource. She's uh, been a great resource for us and exciting times. Oh, that's yeah. wonderful. Congratulations. Fantastic. Any other comments for the good of the order? Uh, Director Broom. I applaud your efforts in the housing thing. Can I get you to pull the microphone a little closer to you? Look at what's going on in San Francisco. It's just a shame. I mean, 
really trying to figure out who's going to be wrestling out lights off. That could happen here and back together. I mean, if I may, just one more comment, because I, I was remiss in, in mentioning this, that, you know, listen, we're going to be looking at this from, you know, from a, a filtered lens, too, regarding, you know, some of our core missions at Dr. Cog, right, most notably related to transportation, that we believe, and I think, and, 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 and the older adults, of course, um, you know, we want to be able to create an environment in which older adults can, you know, age in place, right? That they have the opportunity to be located in areas in which they're mixed use, that they, they uh, don't have to get into a car or, and travel, um, you know, distance to get to a dentist or something like that, right? So we're very conscious of that. We want to make sure that the housing that is being located um, is mixed use, is that it's in transportation efficient areas. Um, it is nice to have, you know, high density development, but if there's no p public transportation or other modes of transportation around that, then it's useless. So I think that's a conversation we want to have with the board, and they seem to be all on, all on board. So stay tuned. We'll, we'll be briefing you. Great. Thank you all for all you do. appreciate you being here and appreciate all of your efforts in, in your everyday life and, and also here with, with uh, RTC. Our next meeting is July 18th. And with that, we are adjourned. Parking passes right there if you need them.